All right, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel, chapter 24. I'm going to cover uh, chapters 24, 25, 26, a little bit of 27 this morning. Uh, as you're turning there to 1 Samuel 24, you'll forgive me if we um, jump into the deep end of the emotional pool this morning. Um, in 1993, some of you know uh, this part of my story, some of you don't, but in 1993, a close friend of my family was murdered. Um, and this has been on my mind lately because the killer was uh, actually just convicted of two other murders just this past month, something that my family, our circle of friends has talked quite a bit about, again, been on our minds uh, quite a bit. Saw uh, one of uh, my family friends uh, post on Facebook not long after the verdict came down uh, that, that hell is too good a place uh, for someone like this. And it reminded me that uh, even among the non-religious, which this person certainly falls into that category, it's not a church goer or anything like that, even among the non-religious, the desire for justice and even an eternal justice is hardwired into who we are. Uh, saw this in other places in the news, even in recent weeks, too, with Jeffrey Epstein's suicide, and there was this sense of outcry of going, well, his victims didn't get a chance to share their story because he was gone too soon. This is a guy who's dead now. You can kind of go, well, fine, justice is done, but no, there's this sense of, there, there should have been more, and those who are complicit should have been taken down as well. So we have this deep desire for justice. The trouble that we face is that if we strip God out of the equation, as we are wont to do in our secular age, then we eliminate the possibility of eternal justice. That, that, that's meaningless. There, there is no eternal justice. You go into a box and rot or something like that. You also eliminate the possibility of, of perfect justice uh, ever being done anyway, even in this life. I mean, we, we know perfect justice doesn't happen here. When people get away with things all the time. So, so where do we go with this desire for justice? What do we do apart from God? Tim Keller, in a quote that I've shared before, uh, points out the only two possibilities that exist if we strip God out of the equation, and they're not good possibilities. He writes this, if there is no judgment day, then there are only two things to do. Lose all hope or turn to vengeance. Either it means that the tyranny and oppression that have been so dominant over the ages will never be redressed, and in the end it will make no difference whether you live a life of justice and kindness or a life of cruelty and selfishness. Or it means that since there is no judgment day, we will need to take up our weapons and go and hunt down the evildoers now. And it's that last part that I want us to focus on this morning because that is a tremendous temptation for us when an injustice is done to, to us, to, to someone we love, uh, we want to take justice into our own hands to make sure that it happens. Even as Christians, we might go, okay, we know perfect justice will be done in glory, but I wanna, I wanna take a little kingdom justice for myself even now as, opposing, uh, as opposed to waiting for God to bring it. Every one of us has been wronged in some way. Every one of us will be wronged again in some way. How should we respond? How do we keep from violence, whether that's literal violence or more likely figurative violence? David learns the lesson that we all need to learn and can learn better because of Christ, because we're this side of the cross. And you're gonna learn it in three stages uh, this morning. So let's take them one at a time. Stage one, the temptation, chapter 24. Let me read the chapter for us first. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of Engedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way, a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord the king, 
When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave Saul, he gave his oath to Saul, and Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. All right, what happens here? So uh, we left Saul last week. He was about to close in on David and then God raised up the Philistines so Saul had to scurry away quickly and deal with that matter. Well, Saul is uh, not at all deterred by God's opposition and so he returns to pursue David in En Gedi yet again. Then we get this sort of strange story. Now, scripture is not famous for having gratuitous details in it, so this little bit about Saul needing to relieve himself is kind of important. But you have to picture how tense this moment is, this scene. You got David and his merry little band huddled in the back of one of the many caves in this region, and you got an army outside. One guy goes into the cave. If he sounds the alarm, this is big trouble. They're trapped in the back of the cave and all that. So this is the tense moment we we have here. And David's men, they kind of have a good point. Right? I mean, God has gift wrapped Saul, it seems like, and put him right there for David to deal with. Although it is interesting, they, they, they quote this promise about the Lord delivering uh, uh, David's enemies to do with whatever he pleases. We didn't get that promise at any point. We've read 1 Samuel, right? Like we haven't missed a lot of words in this book so far. We do not have it. He promised he was gonna deliver the Philistines into his hand, so maybe they just sort of extrapolated this promise or something like that, but we don't quite get the promise in verse four. Well, you see their point they're making still. Well, so David creeps up and all he does is cut the robe, Saul's robe. Uh, what's his motivation in doing this? We gotta look at the fact that in verse five, he is conscience stricken for having done this. So whatever his motivation, it was, it was off. There's a malicious intent behind it. And this is because the robe is symbolic. I and mean, how many times has Saul's robe shown up in Samuel? In fact, Samuel's robe shows up quite a bit in Samuel as well. At one point in chapter 15, Saul grabs Samuel's robe and it rips, and Samuel says, just like that, God is gonna tear the kingdom from your hands. And so David's almost, it seems like he's got this in, on his mind where he's going, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of cut the kingdom away from you, this, this royal robe, this symbol of your authority I'm taking for myself. And so this is an act of violence, sedition against the Lord's anointed. He ought not to have done it, and he realizes this. It says he sharply rebukes his men for encouraging it. That's a really gentle translation, by the way. The Hebrew says he tore his men to shreds. Like he devoured them at this point because of it. God has promised him the kingdom, yes, but that means God has to deliver it, not that David should take it at this point. David, conscience stricken, makes a dangerous decision right afterwards. You see, we got this big army within shouting distance, apparently, of this tiny little band, and David calls out to them, and calls out to Saul. He shows deference and respect in bowing and giving Saul his title. And at this moment, he reinterprets the robe. 
He, he says, here's what the robe symbolizes. It's proof that I could have harmed you, but didn't, which it certainly is. So he says, your, your conspiracy theories are wrong, Saul. If I wanted to kill you, I had the opportunity, and I didn't take it. And so he publicly and explicitly forsakes the way of personal revenge and entrusts the matter to God. He says, look, God can arbitrate between us. God will, in the end, vindicate me because I have not done wrong in this situation. He quotes this proverb, from evil doers come evil deeds. And, and, and maybe this is an invitation for Saul to do a little bit of sam- self-examination, but it's more defending himself at this moment. From evil doers come evil deeds. I didn't do an evil deed right there. What does that say about me? He's inviting Saul to think through this. And we get this shocking response from Saul. He calls David son, my son. It is not how he often refers to him. He usually calls him son of Jesse because he can't even bear to say the guy's name. And this strong show of emotion follows, but we certainly are worried that it's gonna be shallow show of emotion. Emotion is not necessarily a sign of heart change. Uh, it could be what Paul would refer to centuries later in uh, his letter to, to Corinth, a, a, a worldly sorrow. Just, you feel bad about your sin, but you're not actually repentant. Which is a good reminder for us, of course, that we evaluate our repentance in terms of change, not emotions. Most of us feel bad when we do something wrong. But the question is, are we just feeling that way or are we actually going to turn from our sin in those moments? Well, Saul goes on to declare David to be righteous. In this case, the word righteous meaning in the right, doing what you're supposed to be doing. David is not his enemy. And Saul knows this because you don't ever leave your enemy unharmed. And you left me unharmed, so pretty simple logic here. He even goes a step further and declares that David will actually be king. He starts to sound like his son here. He starts to sound like Jonathan going, I I see where this is headed. David will be king. And he makes a covenant of sorts with David saying, "Don't, don't wipe out my descendants when all this goes down, exactly what Jonathan had said as well. So this is promising, this feels good. Although we read this little bit at the end that that's, that's, makes us nervous maybe, because at this point, Saul goes home. He goes back to the palace. Saul who just said, you're going to be king, you know, let's, let's be kind to one another for the next couple of generations and stuff. And you expect him to go home and take David with him, invite him into the palace, get him ready to make this trend. That doesn't happen. David goes back to the stronghold goes back to the cave that he's been hiding in, and so he doesn't seem to trust Saul yet, and as we'll see, that's probably smart. And you see the temptation that David faces in this scene. David could have taken matters into his own hands, and not only that, he could have spiritualized taking matters into his own hands by saying, God has delivered my enemy to me, so of course I was supposed to do this. He's he's gift-wrapped. God had promised he would be king, just like God promises us justice. The question, the temptation is, will we take God's place when it comes to these promises? Will we make it happen ourselves because that would be bringing about an an unjust justice, if we could put it that way. This is why you see um, so many of the Psalms that David writes during this time are uh, imprecatory Psalms, which is just a fancy way of saying they've got curses in them. You know, may the Lord do this to my enemy. And you read these, and these are, these are hard words to read sometimes. But you see what's happening in those Psalms, the lesson that David's starting to learn here at least, is you gotta leave this in God's hands. Because there's a big difference between praying that and acting on it. So when David prays, for example, smash the teeth of the wicked, it's a good prayer. Uh, the teeth being the symbol of violence, right? Like you, you can't devour the poor anymore or something like that. You smash the teeth of the wicked, okay, there's a good prayer. Do you pick up a hammer afterwards? Because that's a different story at that point. And ultimately, this is a, a question of our trust. Will God vindicate the righteous? Will he bring justice? Is he paying attention to see what's happening in the world? These are the questions we've got to ask. 
It takes us into our next scene, by the way, because that's uh, where we're going in the story. So step two of David's learning this lesson is, is God's got this, chapter 25. Let me read it for us. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep. She was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servant, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, Each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day they were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sails of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, Go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband not. She came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine. There were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, It's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battle and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. When the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant." David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk, so she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. 
When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and am ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. David had also married Ahinoam of Jezreel and they both were his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michal, David's wife, to Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Gali. All right, long chapter. Let's tease it out here. First of all, note that this happens after Samuel's death, which is kind of important. This would be a psychological blow for David. Samuel's the prophet who anointed him. He's the one who can back David up, in essence, and say, yes, David is the Lord's anointed. He's the one who's going to be king. So you wonder if doubt is starting to creep in for David at this moment. We also know that some time has passed because we know that David and his men have been taking care of Nabal's shepherds. Uh, this is important because as king, David should act like the shepherd of Israel and that's what he's doing because he's watching out not just for the sheep but for the shepherds themselves and so he, he already had this picture of the sort of king that he will be. And then we meet these two characters, the, the, the people who own these shepherds and sheep and whatnot. The, it's Abigail who is wise and beautiful and then Nabal whose name means fool who is uh, surly and mean not a promising beginning. I do not know why Nabal's parents named him that. Most likely his name sounded like that and because of the actions that he uh, makes in life, they, they, his name kind of gets changed a little bit as it gets handed down to us. The important thing for us to see though is that Nabal is playing the role of Saul in this scene. And we're gonna see that as we keep going. But David has served Nabal in these past few months at least. And so at sheep shearing time, which is a festive time, big party's gonna get thrown and whatnot, he asks to be included. He asks for hospitality, which is a, an important virtue in the ancient Near East. And the servants go to Nabal to ask this in David's name. And that is an important phrase because David is the Lord's anointed. So Nabal's response to David is, in essence, his response to God. And so he doesn't do so well. <laughs> this is going to be important. You'll notice he calls David the son of Jesse, which is what Saul always calls David. It mentions that he's breaking from his master, so he's quite clearly taking Saul's side. Note the contrast between them too, is David has been giving. He's given his time, his energy, in order to take care of Nabal, the shepherds, and all of that. But Nabal, like Saul, only takes. In fact, you get this scene where he's talking, well, why should I give you my water and my meat that I slaughtered for my sheep? You know, this is just all about him. Isaiah, some three centuries later, uh, has this prophecy. It, it almost sounds like he's writing about Nabal in this moment. He says this, Isaiah 32, verse six. For fools speak folly, their hearts are bent on evil. They practice ungodliness and spread error concerning the Lord. The hungry they leave empty, and from the thirsty they withhold water. Which is exactly what Nabal has done for David and his men here. Reminds us, of course, that uh, in the Bible, folly is not a question of mental aptitude. This doesn't mean if you're a fool that you're dumb. That's not it at all. It is a moral category, and folly is often linked to injustice, which is exactly what we have here. That Nabal would let hungry men stay hungry is a severe indictment against him. So when David hears this, he seethes with rage. He had kept his cool reasonably well with Saul, but this guy playing the part of Saul, he's doomed. David's like a, a can of Coke that's been shaken up too many times. He's just ready to blow at this point. So this is trouble coming here. Fortunately, a servant of Nabal knows this and runs to Abigail and clues her in. Just to give you an indication of how bad a person Nabal is, lest we wonder whether or not he deserved the judgment he received, uh, he's so bad that his servant can tell his master's wife that he is a wicked man 
no problem. Nobody's got any issues. Abigail doesn't say, don't talk about him that way. She's like, well, of course. Yeah, we all know that. He is a son of Belial, literally. That word has come up quite a few times in Samuel. It was used of Eli's sons, for example, who were very wicked and who were also under the Lord's judgment. So this is the sort of person we're dealing with here. Abigail, when she hears what has happened, springs into action and does what Nabal should have done. She prostrates herself before David, which is a proper position before a king. And then she goes on to say, the Lord is trying to keep you from blood guilt, from staining your hands with blood that shouldn't have been shed. She's trying to, the Lord is trying to keep you from vengeance. And she goes on even to explain why this matters so much by mentioning that God is going to establish a dynasty for David. This is incredible. Nobody's mentioned David's dynasty. That's 2 Samuel 7. We got, we got chapters to go until we get there. And yet she sees what is coming. And she says he's gonna do this, establish this dynasty because David fights the Lord's battles. That's an important phrase. David, you don't fight your own battles. You fight the battles that the Lord has for you. And she reiterates God's promises to him in evocative terms too. He's gonna hurl your enemies away from you like they were in the pocket of a sling. Well, we've seen an enemy go down, one of the Lord's enemies, at David's hands because of something coming out of the pocket of a sling, right? Like, do you remember Goliath? Do you remember all of that? That's what's gonna happen. You, you can trust God in this moment. Now, when that happens, when God establishes your dynasty, you don't want your conscience stained at that time. And so David recognizes that she is, in effect, a prophetess here. And so he thanks, not her for her wise words, he thanks God for sending her and keeping him from guilt in this way. Grants her request, I'm not gonna take matters into my own hands. Nabal, meanwhile, keeps playing Saul's part. Did you notice that he's feasting like a king at this moment? So he's still acting like Saul, but when he hears what has happened and all that it entails, his heart fails him, and a short while later he dies. In fact, we read that he dies because the Lord struck him dead. This is the punishment he deserved for opposing God, for opposing God's anointed. And so David recognizes what has happened here, sees that the Lord has upheld his cause and that he did bring justice in the end. And we get, you know, a marriage follows and a few words about some other uh, women. It, it, it matters, of course, that David's got too many wives at this point. Scripture frowns on people having more than one wife and that's gonna cause problems, but that's gonna cause problems in 2 Samuel. We're not doing that at this point, so we're just gonna leave that there for now. Do you see that this whole scene that we get in chapter 25 is almost an enacted parable because you've got Nabal playing the role of Saul and David has the opportunity to respond righteously to Saul in the story that's coming because he learns in this little acted parable that he can trust God. God is gonna vindicate him. God will uphold his cause. God will bring justice. He can trust God. How freeing that is. This simple reminder, God's got this. God's got this. I don't need to fret or fume or worst of all, fashion my own justice because I know that God is in control. And we're gonna see how this plays out then in stage three, chapter 26, the lesson is learned. David's gonna get another chance. So let me read it, chapter 26. It's gonna sound familiar, a lot of it. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, is not David hiding on the hill of Achilah which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 select Israelite troops to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hekilah facing to Shimon, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out, went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. 
So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord the king? Someone came to destroy your lord the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the lord lives, you and your men must die because you did not guard your master, the lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord the king listen to his servant's words. The lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, people have done it, may they be cursed before the lord. They have driven me today from my share in the lord's inheritance and have said, Go serve other gods. And do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. And Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. And Saul said to David, May you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way, and Saul returned home. So why do we get two almost identical stories back to back? Uh, always a question. And they sandwich the, the, the Nabal episode, and that, that seems to be important. What we see here is that God is clearly training David. And so in this scene, very similar to the one that happened back in chapter 24, we can see that he has learned the lesson that God intended to teach him. Entrust this matter to me. I've got this, is what God is saying. So Saul's bluster from the last meeting is is clearly false uh, because as soon as he gets some new intel, he musters his army again and goes out to try and capture David again. The only problem, of course, is with so many men, 3,000, he's pretty easy to track, uh, plus his intel's a little bit off, and so David's able to find him and sneak up on him at this point. A little bit odd, but uh, Saul and Abner forget to station sentries in the camp. This is not a good move. We're gonna learn why a little bit later, uh, but... It makes it easy for David and Abishai to sneak into the camp. And Abishai offers to kill Saul at this moment, which is nice, by the way, because that means the blood guilt would be on him and not on David. So we got like a nice loophole thing going here. Uh, And plus, Abishai makes a good point because we now know for sure Saul is not ever gonna give up this pursuit. He can't be trusted. He's not gonna keep his word. So maybe it's time for Saul to die, but David forbids it. There's no temptation here. There are no missteps at this moment. He says, so interesting, he says the Lord himself will strike him or he'll you know, die of old age or get killed in battle. But why does he say that the Lord will strike him down? Because he just did that to Nabal. So David knows God, God's got this. He's gonna take care of it. So he grabs the spear, which is not only a symbol of Saul's power, but also Saul's violence against him, his aggression against him. Remember, the spear is the one he keeps hurling at David. And he also grabs the water jar, which in the middle of the desert is important. This is your source of sustenance. So he, in essence, disarms him and takes his life, but symbolically only. And that symbol underscores his refusal to do it in reality. Uh, Then, at this point, as they're sneaking away, we learn about this deep sleep, same sleep that God put Adam into when he 
fashioned Eve out of Adam's rib and stuff, so this is a, a profound sleep. So God is protecting him. God made sure they're all asleep so that this could happen. And then we get the similar scene. David goes a little ways away, calls out to Saul, a little bit dangerous. Saul responds, my son, is that you? And David says, I still haven't done anything wrong. Remember that conversation we had a couple days ago? And then stop hunting me. And he says this though, he says, what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up driving me from the Lord's presence. In other words, out of the promised land. And I'm gonna end up living in a country like Philistia. And, and, and what gods do they have in Philistia? Like what temple am I gonna go to to worship? Am I gonna be worshiping Dagon at this point? And think of how awful it would be I, the Messiah, lowercase m, to have to worship in a place like that. And this gets at Saul, I guess, so he confesses sin. He says, I've acted like a fool, which is interesting. I've, I've, I've been Nabal at this point. It's a different word that's used for fool, but the same idea, of course. And so by saying i am basically been Nabal in this episode, he's saying I deserve the same punishment that fell on Nabal. I deserve God's judgment. The key phrase in this chapter comes in verse 23 when David says the Lord rewards righteousness and faithfulness. Righteousness and faithfulness is exactly what David demonstrates in this episode. He acts rightly. He doesn't do any vengeance here at this point. That's his righteousness. And he entrusts himself to God in verse 24. That's faithfulness. I believe God. I'm gonna leave myself in God's hands. And in this, he sets a pattern for all of us to follow when we are wronged. Before we get there, though, it's interesting that David falters soon after this. Uh, he falters pretty badly in 2 Samuel. He, he's going to actually uh, bring blood guilt on himself because he murders Uriah the Hittite after raping his wife Bathsheba. But that's a little ways down the line. We're talking in the next chapter, which I'm not gonna read. You can read it at home. But chapter 27, he does head to Philistia and he serves the Philistine king, but he does it by deceiving him regularly. He lies about which towns and regions he's attacking. And when he attacks these towns, he wipes them out, whole villages. Doesn't leave anyone left alive so that no one can snitch on him and say which towns he's actually attacking. Now in doing this, he's sort of doing the Lord's work because these were the uh, peoples that Israel was supposed to drive out of the promised land under Joshua and they failed to do so. And God gives Israel the promised land only after the full measure of sin has filled up among these people. So these are ones who deserve God's judgment again. So, okay, that makes sense, I guess, except that that's not actually his motivation. (laughs) His motivation is to make sure nobody snitches on him. So he's not really doing the Lord's work, he's taking care of himself. In other words, he doesn't quite trust God enough to keep himself from doing some pretty sketchy things. There's not as much righteousness and faithfulness in this episode. Reminds us that David is not the Messiah. He is a Messiah, lowercase m. He is a sinner himself in need of saving. David, in other words, also needs the son of David to come, Jesus. And Jesus and David have a lot of things in common, even from this story. Jesus is also unjustly pursued by fools. Although he is not just uh, have his life at risk, but is actually killed by these fools in the greatest act of injustice the world has ever known or will ever know. And the other contrast, of course, is that Jesus was without sin. Jesus' conscience is never stained. He doesn't ever even cut a little piece of the robe or something like that. But it, it reminds us that even Jesus does not take the kingdom by force. I mean, Jesus, all things are gonna be put under Jesus' feet. He does not do that by violence. He tells Peter to put the sword away when he's arrested. Instead, he receives the kingdom from God in sacrificial surrender. Now, we are not the Lord's anointed, to be quite clear, not even lowercase m. We have no kingdom to take because there's no kingdom promised us. We simply enter into Christ's kingdom. But the New Testament still shows how this lesson applies to us in exactly the same way. Paul writes this in Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. 
God's got this, in other words. That will happen. Justice will be done. Evildoers will be punished. You don't need to take it into your own hands. How do we give up vengeance? This is what we're getting here. But I gotta say, this is probably easy for most of us because we're probably not gonna be wronged at a deep, deep level where we live, this part of the world. You got a blood boiling rage though. Something like what happened uh, to this family friend. Like I cannot imagine what this father felt like. He's the one who found his daughter murdered on her front steps. Uh, The rage you would feel at that moment. A simple command, don't take vengeance, is probably not gonna suffice. I'm just gonna try really hard to obey this. If you're gonna do that, it's gonna take a gospel motivation and that's what we are given in Christ. Listen to what Peter says and how this uh, frees us to obey the commands in Romans 12. Peter writes this, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The cross teaches us the lesson that David learned in the wilderness. The Lord rewards those who are righteous and faithful. Exactly what Peter's talking about here. We can entrust ourselves to him who judges justly because we know that every wrong ever committed in all of history will either be punished in Christ at Calvary, which is an important reminder in its own right, of course, because it reminds us that somebody needs to take vengeance on us because of our sin and the ways we have wronged others. So either punished in Christ at Calvary or will be punished in the end just like Nabal was struck dead. And the resurrection guarantees the vindication of the righteous because that's what God does for Jesus in that moment. This was an injustice, I'm gonna make it right. That vindication might be slow, but it is sure to come. The resurrection is the guarantee. Now, again, we live in comfortable suburban America. We're probably not gonna take vengeance into our hands, literal violence or anything like that. It's almost good at this moment uh, to listen to those who have experienced violence at a different level. Miroslav Volf was a Croatian theologian who saw the war in the Balkans firsthand, the horrors, the slaughter, the rape, the genocide that takes place in that time, and he writes this, because I think some of us get a little squishy when we read things like the Lord struck Nabal dead and we think, well, did he really deserve it? And that's because we live really comfortable lives. So listen to what Wolf says. He says this, if God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a final end to violence by like striping, striking Nabal's dead, that God would not be worthy of worship. The only means of prohibiting all recourse to violence by ourselves is to insist that violence is legitimate only when it comes from God. My thesis, that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance will be unpopular with many in the West, but it takes the quiet of a suburban home for the birth of the thesis that human nonviolence corresponds to God's refusal to judge. In a scorched land, soaked in the blood of the innocent, it will invariably die with other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. That is an important reminder for us that God is not harsh, but good. We should listen to Wolf because he's experienced these things on a deeper level than we have. We also probably need to reapply him slightly because again, probably not gonna be tempted to physical violence for the most part. Few of us will have to seek that. But figurative violence, well, that's a different story. Like assassination, maybe not. Character assassination, sure, I could do that, no problem. The top temptation we have, I would guess, in this area is probably to simple PR victories. You know what I mean by that? Like we we just want others to know that we were right and they were wrong. And we are willing to make sure that they know that. Good social media posts can do that. A little bit of gossip, a little bit of slander. I mean, you picture the scenario, right? There's there's some sort of conflict and the other side uh, distorts the truth or, or outright lies, but they're listened to. And so you're the one who's punished. And what do you do in that situation? You go to war. You take it into your own hand. I want vindication in the eyes of the public and I'm willing to sin to get it. Gossip, slander, like I said, plus bitterness. 
and anger and maybe divisiveness. I mean, think, look, that happens in the church. Somebody wrongs you like that, that sort of conflict and that lie and people think this about you and you're good under church discipline instead of them. What do you wanna do? You wanna leave the church. Maybe take some people with you. That is an offense against a holy God because that is taking justice into your own hands rather than staying and doing the messy gospel work of real reconciliation. And this is personal, like I have been wronged and I have been wronged by the church. Not here, not this church. Y'all are like, who was it? (laughs) In a deep way, in a way that uh, profoundly affected my family, which is much harder than just dealing with it yourself and whatnot. And I was so blessed because by God's grace, he sent me and Abigail too. (laughs) She was not a beautiful woman, little older gentleman, so no temptation there, that's pretty good. I mean, David already had a wife, so maybe, no, that's bad, okay? So, but this is somebody who got in front of me at that moment and just said one simple sentence, you know, of you just, you don't need to do this. And it was so important because otherwise I would have come into this church with my conscience stained because I would have taken this into my own hands. In those moments when we're wronged like that, like David, like the son of David, we can entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We persist in righteousness and faithfulness because God is good and just and attentive and sovereign and when we make mistakes, he's merciful. In other words, God's got this. Let's pray. Lord, help us in the moments when we are wronged. First of all, to acknowledge how often we wrong others and that as we cry out for justice, others are crying out against us for justice as well. And may that bring humility in our lives and uh, cause us to run back to the cross and to the empty tomb for a reminder of your great love for us. May we also remember though, as we look to the cross and the tomb, that you will vindicate the righteous, that we can trust you completely, that in the end, all will be set right. It may not be in exactly the timing we'd prefer, but that's just because we are finite creatures and your timing is better. We trust you, Lord. We worship you as the one who judges justly. And we worship you as the one who is merciful and gracious and who has made a way for us to escape the judgment we deserve because we are all fools by sending Christ in our place to suffer our punishment on the cross. And Lord, if there's any here who has not yet escaped that punishment by hiding themselves in Christ, and even now, would you draw them to yourself, we pray for your name's sake. Amen and amen.